If you're an author or plan to be one, get excited because this podcast is for you. Book Marketing Mentors is the only podcast dedicated to helping you successfully market and sell your book. If you're ready for empowering conversations with successful marketing mavens, then grab a coffee or tea and listen in to your host, international best-selling author, Susan Friedman. Welcome to Book Marketing Mentors, the weekly podcast where you learn proven strategies, tools, ideas, and tips from the masters. Every week, I introduce you to a marketing master who will share their expertise to help you market and sell more books. Today, my special guest is Sherry Fitz. Sherry not only believes that ideas and empathy are a professional's true currency, she's been advocating it for nearly 30 years. An internationally recognized speaker, success coach, social media expert, and visionary pioneer of digital emotional intelligence, working primarily in the financial services sector. A dear friend and colleague, Sherry, what an absolute pleasure it is to welcome you to the show, and thank you for being this week's guest expert and mentor. Oh, Susan, I am so happy to be with you today and to do this alongside you. I've been excited to spend some time geeking out with you about marketing and all of the things, right? (laughs) All of the things. Well, I'm going to dig right in and talk about what I read in your bio, this digital emotional intelligence. So first of all, I'd love you to explain what that is. And then Let's look at why it's important for our listeners to know about it and even perhaps practice it. I'll give you a little backstory. In 2020, I did 80 plus workshops around helping professionals in financial services really use the virtual platform effectively. And I called that lights, camera, cell. And then as a speaker and a thought leader and taking on that role, one of the things I try to do is regularly reinvent myself. And I went to Sedona thinking I was going to sit in a vortex and have amazing things happen. And I did no vortexing at all, by the way. I ate good food and drank good wine and that was about it. And enjoyed the massively beautiful open skies they have there. And then I came home and I still was like, I was in the middle of rebranding and I kept thinking to myself, what do I do? There's so many things that I talk about and I needed to whittle that down a little bit. And I was walking the dog and I went, "Hmm, I help people with their virtual intelligence. And I went, no, 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 no. I help people with their digital intelligence. And I went, hmm, I help people with their digital emotional intelligence. And I went, wow, that's it. I call it digital EQ. And so from that moment, I mean, I even know that I was on like the north side of Gleason here in Portland when I was walking the dog. From that moment, I've begun to really put a framework into this methodology, digital emotional intelligence. And essentially, it's the intersection of emotional intelligence and digital influence. I can't think of anything more crucial for professionals and business people and authors to really consider as we move forward, this world we're in has been changed for forever. Oh, we live in a digital world. I mean, it's, it's all about digital now. And obviously, since, as you say, 2020, and we had to go virtual, it's especially relevant and it's not going to go away. It's only going to get further. So I love the fact that you've tuned into this and you've branded this digital EQ. That's Mm -hmm. so powerful. Yes. (laughs) Makes me happy. It just lights me up too. There's something new, something different, even though you've taken, as you said, and the way you came to it was things you looked at, well, what are you good at? What are you doing And I think that's a good way to really look at ourselves. And I love the fact that you reinvented yourself. I want to go back to that, but keep going about this. Yes, I didn't mean to interrupt you here, but it was just so exciting. I had to get my two cents worth in. (laughs) Oh, please just kick me in the shins. Give me a virtual kick in the shins anytime, Susan. 
let me just say one thing, which is that I have been speaking to this for quite some time. I try to say that I help people with heart-centered branding. Try to use those words in financial services and people will look at you cross-eyed and laugh. So what started to happen though, is that as I, again, began calling it a methodology and who am I to create a methodology? But I am, I get to just like you can, right? So as I began creating a framework and creating a methodology, what I was finding was people were able to grab onto that. If I said heart-centered branding or emotionally-based connections or all that kind of stuff, which are certainly part of the emotional intelligence that I'm bringing to the table, I don't think I would get the traction. But because I put a name with it, created a framework and called it a methodology, now I've got something. And I want to put a pin in that because I have seen how it has shifted things in my marketing, in the head nodding that happens, in the receptivity that I'm receiving. I have a dear friend in the financial services industry, and she's always admonishing people to like name their product. I think sometimes people get crazy and name too many things, but certainly this has been a beneficial thing to me to create a framework and a methodology and name it. And now it's in the trademarking world. And that's really important too, is that once you create something and you give it a name, that you do trademark it. So obviously that other people can't use it because, hey, it's sexy. I mean, we know that emotional intelligence, you know, was big several years ago. And now you've taken that to a different stage in a different environment. That's really exciting. So talk to us about how you see our listeners. How could they use this to their benefit? If you think about the two components, emotional intelligence and digital influence, let's just think about emotional intelligence for a moment and the concepts behind emotional intelligence. They're around understanding and kind of naming and being aware of your own emotions. And then they are around understanding and naming and being aware of other people's emotions. When I think about the world of marketing and branding and messaging, I'll use my world of financial services because it's a nonfiction professional services area. I see when I meet with financial advisors, a human being who has spent their life working to help other people become financially stable and secure. And a lot of the advisors that I know help people raise their kids and help people sadly bury their parents. And all of the life's milestones usually come alongside a financial decision. And so these people are very, in many cases, deeply caring and deeply emotionally aware people. Yet when I look at their marketing, no, that's not the case. So what I see though, is that while they are these deeply caring individuals, their messaging, their outreach, their digital experience, people have with their digital experience is very formal and not imbued with a lot of emotion. And if we live in this world where before anybody does business with anybody else, that you get Googled and there's this lack of alignment between how you show up personally and how you show up digitally, then that's not good. And so the idea of bringing this concept of emotional intelligence into one's messaging and marketing and branding is what digital EQ is about. That is so powerful. I mean, you've touched on so many different things. First of all, you work in a niche market and I'm all about niche marketing, as our listeners will tell you, because I spout it probably almost every time I do an interview. First and foremost, you're in a niche market. You understand that market really well. You understand where their challenges lie, as you said, with regard to how their messaging, which obviously is really important, and I talk about that a lot in my virtual retreats with my authors, that your messaging is key. Now, if your messaging isn't in alignment 
with your target audience, we have a problem. And if I understand you correctly, that's what you're saying, correct? Correct. And I love the fact that you say niche instead of niche. So (laughs) (laughs) first off, indeed, I have been in the financial services industry for 30 years. And there is my value that I know this industry. I know the rules. I know the regs. I know the words. I know the issues. And I have opted to stay in this industry because with that, which is interesting, right? This small sliver of the world, it gets massively huge when you think about it from a niche perspective. And ditto from the stuff that you cover in your virtual retreats around messaging, especially now where it's often the first way somebody comes in contact with us and we're not even there to be able to shake somebody's hand and look them in the eye and have a warm human embrace. We have to rely on our digital experience that we create and the messages that we create and the words that we choose to use. The word that comes up for me, Sherry, is authenticity. And especially with the audience you're dealing with, you talked about them having to deal with life cycle issues as they relate to finances with people. Well, if you're not authentic and you're not somebody I feel I can trust and money obviously is a is key in our world, we want to do business with people we like and we trust more than ever now. That means you've got to be authentic. What you're talking about, I think, dials right into that. Indeed. I wish there was another word, but there's not. This word of authenticity, it describes it so clearly and we all get a very clear picture. And then I also feel like perhaps some people work, try to hack that authenticity. That may be a whole other subject. (laughs) Oh, indeed. I'll slap them when I see them. Yeah. Something else you talked about, and we talked about your meaning of a professional's true currency are their ideas and their empathy. And I know we've talked about empathy. Talk to us about the ideas part of it. What makes that such a important aspect with regard to true currency for a professional? So when I think about digital EQ, there's the emotional intelligence part, and then there's the digital influence. And so the ideas reside in this world of digital influence. We've all heard of the terminology thought leader. And there are people who will anoint themselves as thought leaders. They even put that in their LinkedIn bio, yet their actions don't reflect that. What I see is is there's not too terribly much risk taking on offering up a new idea or really presenting some new concept or leaning into the future. And I believe that especially in such a crowded marketplace like financial services, the only way for an individual to stand out is to really begin to work toward thought leadership. From a thought leadership perspective, it is new ideas or new content or new like methodologies or whatnot. I think in order to call oneself a thought leader, and I don't abide by calling oneself a thought leader. I abide by behaving as a thought leader. And I think they're different. Presenting new ideas and really calling on one's audience to think about things differently is going to get you attention and going to get you credibility. And then it's going to do the whole no like, and trust thing. So I am a big proponent of taking on the challenge of thought leadership. Which goes hand in glove with the fact that I talk about authors becoming recognized experts in their field. Mm -hmm. And the thought leadership is part of that. You've got to be seen as this thought leader. So having those new ideas, that new content, or as you've done, you've taken different environments and created something new, a new methodology, a new framework. As you say, you've called it digital EQ. People in their books have got their own methods that they're touting. And 
that's what they're going out to the marketplace with. This whole idea of thought leadership is so key in developing that credibility and being seen as that recognized expert within their industry. And it's not just writing the book, it's more than that. It's taking the book and I believe sort of giving it life. What are your thoughts Uh, on that? Oh, yes. There you go. I didn't (laughs) know that was a yes or no question. You're like, (laughs) (laughs) and the work that's gone into creating the book is demonstrating thought leadership on point. And now beginning to, I would say, take that energy that you've poured into the book and now pouring it into your target audience. And to your point, taking the virtual stage, whatever that might be, and giving yourself permission, you know, and the challenge, and then the goal of truly owning your thought leadership. You know the stats more than I do, Susan. Many people think about writing a book. Only some people make it happen. And that same energy and that same drive and that same intention and focus and all of the work that has been poured into a book, now those same muscles are used for creating a thought leadership platform. I Mm -hmm. love that. Oh, yes. All about exercising those muscles. You've exercised them in one arena, and now you're going to take them and strengthen them in the other arena. Yeah, I love that. I use that metaphor for people because you know, some people that I work with, financial advisors in particular, they've not written a book. And the idea of writing brings to mind not only the challenge of writing, but then advisors is a very highly regulated industry. And in like in the 401k world where I grew up, that industry is regulated by five government entities. And in some states, six, if you toss in their insurance thing. And so they often immediately tell themselves, no, I can't do that. And what I try to tell them is the act of writing, even if what happens is what you write gets hacked apart by compliance, the act of writing strengthens a muscle of perception, of curiosity, of introspection, of forward looking. It does all these things that provide you with better muscles to just evaluate the world around you. And I don't know. I mean, I just, the act of writing is such a powerful act. I think people forget about it. I was doing an interview and somebody asked me, well, not everybody can be a thought leader. And I said, true. And I said, yet the effort to try will change your life. Mm, That's powerful. So let's go and look at the practical side. I see you as a thought leader in your environment. Talk to us about some of the practical things that you do that create this thought leadership in the eyes of your target audience. I just got done talking about writing. And then I will tell you that I missed a couple of classes in school where you put the semicolon or the colon, I can't remember, and I have a tendency to overuse commas. And so interestingly, some people have math anxiety. I would say that I still navigate writing anxiety, that the judge in my head starts being a critique. And rah, 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 rah. One of the things that I work at regularly is using email as a conversation tool with my audience, using email as a way for me to gift my audience little tidbits and treats. So email is extraordinarily valuable as a means of just a little tiny bit of that muscle every week gets exercised and a little bit of that critique gets smacked down every week. So I use email because email, by the way, I own my email list. It is, in my mind, I own it. It's owned property. Then I participate, since I'm in professional services, I participate on LinkedIn. I'm not as active on LinkedIn as I used to be, which is hilarious because 
you know, COVID hit in 2020 and all of a sudden LinkedIn blew up and I stepped away from it, which is frankly hilarious because I've been telling people how to use LinkedIn since 2006. I made a commitment over the past couple of months to be more active on LinkedIn. And I will say, though, that that's not my primary strategy because having a conversation with my audience is challenging on LinkedIn. And LinkedIn is rented property. Somebody else owns it. They can change the algorithms and poof, there goes my audience. I think I've got 8,000 friends. No, I don't. But if I have those same 8,000 people on my email list, ooh, la, la, I can talk to them and they can hit reply. So from a tangible perspective, where you own the relationship is via email. You own the conversation there and you also on your website because that's kind of like your front door and it's 24 hour front door. Those are the two things that I put a lot of energy into. So I just completely redid my website the first time in six years. New content, new brand, new messaging, everything. And I'll say that this is the first time that I've put myself front and center. And that too shows your expertise. I mean, having looked at your website, you're speaking to your audience. People can tell straight away that if they're in financial services, you're one of the people that they really need to go to. So you can tell straight away. And I think, again, that speaks to the whole idea of niching, that people know and see who you are, you're a thought leader, you're up front and center, you're sharing these, as you call them, tidbits and treats for people every week. You also do a podcast, I believe. Isn't that correct? I did a podcast. It was early to the podcast world. I started doing it hilariously. I thought I was late. I started doing a podcast in 2015, 2016, and it's called Women Rocking Wall Street and talk about a niche. It is women in financial services, even further down as a niche. And it was the first podcast dedicated to women in financial services, an extraordinarily male-dominated industry. There are a fair amount of podcasts dedicated to women in tech. But when I launched mine, there was not a podcast dedicated to women in financial services. My challenge is, and I'm sure that other people have probably faced this, my challenge was that this podcast was a passion project to serve women in financial services because I've been in the industry for 30 years and I have seen an awful lot take place. I wanted to be almost some place for women to go to have their experience validated that when they're told to be quiet and not raise their hand, not necessarily literally, but in such a male dominated industry. And so I wanted to validate their experience. I'm in the process of thinking about how can I shift that, still serve that audience, but have that podcast serve me much like what you're doing with this podcast. You are serving an audience. There's a natural connection between your podcast, and then the other valuable, you know, services and solutions that you offer your audience. There's a direct connection. With my podcast before, there was not that direct connection. There was no call to action. You got to have a call to action. Well, that's funny. You should segue into mistakes because our listeners know that I love talking about mistakes. That was a key one that you committed But in general, what do you see that people, the mistakes that they're making? I mean, one of them, as you said earlier, was in the messaging, that the messaging was too formal and needs to be more informal and more relationship oriented. What else do you see in the marketing environment, the mistakes that people are making? And it may be ones that you've made that, you know, we can learn from as well. Well, I'll say the one thing that kind of comes to mind is I always say that it's not business, it's personal. I mean, remember that whole thing of, you know, it's not personal, it's just business. I flip it around. It's not business, it's personal. I think the one thing I would say is oftentimes, particularly if I think about nonfiction authors, chances are there's a fair amount of people whose audience is business to business. The mistake that I see happening is that there's a failure to realize that everyone is a consumer regardless of whether they're inside a business or not. So it's always personal. I think that's the first piece that I always preach. 
I remember I was responsible for the agenda for a conference a couple of years ago where about 100 people were coming in. My only objective for the whole conference was that people would walk away understanding that they were in consumer finance, even though they think that they're in the 401k world, right? Retirement planning stuff. Not, not, uh, 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 uh. You're in consumer finance. And in consumer finance, these are the trends that are happening and you need to pay attention to them. We are all consumers, regardless of what our title is, which means that there's always some personal driver going on. There's always some personal thing going on. And you can't necessarily name that in a business environment, but it's there and I want you to recognize it. So that's maybe the first one. Going back to mistakes I've made, how much time do you have? (laughs) I just want to comment on what you just said, because I think that's really important is the fact that people are dealing with people. Authors are people. The book, well, it's tangible but it's not the product. The real product, I believe, is the author. Yes, the book gives you credibility as the, you know, an expert in that subject, helps you in terms of thought leadership and going out there and becoming that trusted expert authority. But the book doesn't sell itself. You help sell that book. It's your passion. It's your messaging, I believe, that are the blueprints for selling. And we're dealing with people Mm -hmm. and people want to know people. Mm -hmm. You want to know the author and the author can help you get excited about the value that he or she puts in the book. But at the end of the day, it's the author, not the book that's Mm -hmm. valuable. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that goes to your point that people deal with people. In fact, I read somewhere, I can't remember where it was, Susan, where somebody said that the further that you get along in your career and your success, the more people are paying to be with you. Mm. Regardless, it's you, to your point. You know, I think for me, I've dabbled in a variety of different things from a marketing perspective, because I'm just curious about it. So podcasting, you know, I wrote a book. And I'll say that the mistake that I made with my book is really not using that in the way that you, you know, are a proponent of. The book was published in 2016 and I um, failed to give it life. I wrote it and then there was no call to action. And so now what I do spending any money on any kind of marketing or any kind of marketing solution or whatever it is, the first question that I ask myself is what's my call to action? What do I want to have happen as a result of doing this or spending this money? Because marketing is my hobby as well. And yet that doesn't necessarily serve my business. So I've done a lot with trying out marketing automation. That's extreme or spending money on consultants to help me figure out confusion soft. And yet I didn't really have a clear call to action. And then once that I, you know, landed on that call to action, was I willing to go all in to make that happen? I mean, I had a course. I am usually two to three years ahead of where everybody is in a marketing space. And so podcast early, course early, a lot of things. And what I would do is I'd spend all this energy and time and money creating them, yet would fail to go the extra remaining 10% to bring it to market and give it life. Yeah. I didn't I, have you. <laughs> <laughs> you do now. You do I know. Now. What you're saying there is also key because one of the first questions I ask my authors when they come to me and say, hey, you know, will Aviva publish my book? I said, well, what do you want the book to do for you? Ah, uh, yeah. Yep, I mean, exactly. I think that's key. And Mm -hmm. I would have asked you that question, you know, if you'd come to me with your book, I mean, that would have been the first question. Then, of course, who is it for? Well, I know because you're in the financial services industry and you even are highlighting maybe even a micro niche within that. And that's the, you know, the women in the financial service industry. I mean, I think that's a micro niche, which could be very powerful for you, but that's a whole other story. Yeah. Any event, yeah. I think that that's fabulous. 
How can our listeners find out more about Sherry Fitz? Yeah, tell us. Well, find me at my fabulous new website, please. It's sherryfitz.com, which is S-H-E-R-I-F-I-T-T-S.com. Yes, Sherry spelled wrong and Fitz is spelled wrong. But uh, trust me, you can find me there. And then I've got a little, my lead magnet from on my website, right? A lead magnet is something that's so valuable. You're going to give me your email address. I've got five ways to really amplify your digital influence that I've mapped out. Some ideas about, you know, the email marketing is one of the first ones about not building your business on rented property. So find me at sherryfits.com. If you can find me at sherryfits on Instagram, you'll just see pictures of my dog and random hearts I find all over the world. <laughs> I love it. So we'll put that in the show notes, Sherry. And I also know that uh, you've agreed to do a little something extra for our premium members that we'll do right after this podcast interview. But before I let you go on this side of the fence, I'm going to say, yeah, what's the golden nugget that you'd like to leave our listeners with? I would like you to get extremely curious about your target audience and how they feel. It's one of the four pieces of emotional intelligence and getting really curious about how they feel. And it might not have anything to do with you and what your offer is. And then perhaps taking that one step further and going, how do they feel and what do I want them to feel as a result of this blog post or this book or this video or this post. That's what I'd love for you to take away. Oh, I love that. That's so powerful. And perhaps we can delve deeper into that uh, for our premium members. But in the meantime, I want to thank you for sharing your wisdom so generously here for our listeners. And listeners, this was really powerful. I suggest you listen to it a few times because hidden underneath a lot of what Sherry said are some real gems. Go dig them out. In the meantime, I want to thank you for taking your precious time and listening to this interview. And I sincerely hope that it sparks some ideas you can use to sell more books. Here's wishing you much book and author marketing success. The time is now to take action and finally build your book selling empire. And the great news is that Susan is here to help you. Visit bookmarketingmentors.com and sign up for a free 15 minute book marketing strategy session with Susan. She'll help you discover your first steps to marketing and selling your book. Only those who take action are rewarded. So visit bookmarketingmentors.com and we'll see you again next week.